It's a very simple answer. It's food from cells. It's the idea that instead of raising a whole animal or growing a whole plant, we can produce that food very directly from a bioreactor that looks a little bit like uh, brewing equipment um, outside of an animal. And when we think about growing food from cells, I think a lot of us think of lab-grown meat, but you could produce milk this way, you could produce egg proteins, you could produce things like honey and chocolate. It's really a completely new paradigm to producing food rather than uh, just a couple products. That is an even better question. Um, so I have one fact that I'd like you to keep in the back of your mind. Today we dedicate one third of our planet to growing animals for food. So that is equivalent to all of North and South America combined. Keep that in the back of your mind. The second fact is, because we have industrialized animal agriculture so much, it is incredibly prone to antibiotic resistance, which is, of course, terrible for public health. You don't want to be able to go to the dentist, get a regular procedure, and have your antibiotics not work. Um, antibiotic resistance. The second thing is epidemic viruses. We are seeing things like avian flus and swine flus wipe out tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of animals in a span of months because we farm animals so closely together. And third, the way that we farm animals is extractive. I think we think of animal agriculture, or we think of agriculture as regenerative, but we know that regenerative is kind of a smaller piece of how we feed the world today. And so the reason why we need to pursue cellular agriculture is our current food system, especially in industrialized animal agriculture, is very precarious. And when we head into a climate change world, we need to really diversify where our food comes from so we can be more resilient. <laughs> So yesterday we had a session where we talked about the criticisms, and there are lots. Um, I think one criticism that comes to mind is, is this just hype? Is this just an idea that we're talking about that's never going to happen? Something that's kind of like a science fiction idea that's exciting but will never take place? Or is it the kind of hype where it does take place but it actually does not ignite a revolution? What if we're only producing products that cost a thousand dollars and don't affect the kind of populace who needs to be fed? What if it doesn't actually contribute to food security or isn't better for animals or doesn't contribute to uh, food in a climate change world? I think the third piece that I'm most worried about is, does this just perpetuate our existing food system? When you think about it, we're introducing, you know, so the, the way that cellular agriculture looks right now out there in the world is there's maybe 150 companies. All of them are funded by venture capital trying to make this thing happen. That is super exciting. But on the flip side, there's very, very little funding in the public academic space. So when we have all these companies kind of vying to do something that's great for the world, what is really pressuring them to do that? And so I worry about things like corporate consolidation. I worry about things like introducing you know, pharmaceutical level IP into our food system and making it more exclusive. I worry that these foods and food practices are not going to be accessible. I worry that they're actually going to make our food system kind of more boring and less tasty, more kind of burger-fied and nugget-ified. Um, I'm worried that we're not going to treat cellular agriculture as a new toolbox for food production and we're only going to see it as a way to kind of extend the industrialization of a food system that I think most of us agree sucks right now. Um, so I grew up in Edmonton, Alberta, which is a uh, very close to the tar sands and also a site of much cattle ranching. And I kind of grew up being an environmentalist thinking, you know, biking to school, you know, I'm not in a truck, so that's pretty good. You know, I'm doing my part. And I was studying cell biology at the University of Alberta. And in my fourth year, I decided to take a meat science class. I just had a spare. And I saw a poster on the wall, and I was like, meat science? Oh, I'm doing a, a bio degree. Why, am, why don't I have uh, the option to take all these ag classes? So I took this meat science class. And the first class, my professor showed us a graph of how many billions of animals are slaughtered each year. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. And then he showed us the environmental impact of those animals and the land use. 
And I thought, oh my gosh, we're, I'm, here I am thinking about fuels when you know, there's a Hummer in my kitchen. And <laughs> we have this, this enormous opportunity to change a completely new system that's kind of been under the radar for a long time. This, is, this was 15 years ago or so. And I'm glad to see that animal agriculture is much more on the radar as a kind of place where change needs to happen. Um, but at the time, it really felt like so neglected. And my, at, I learned about this idea a few classes later. The same professor said, you know, maybe one day we'll grow food from cells. And I thought, oh my god, that's so obvious. I was learning about how to grow tissues and organs for you know, skin transplants and uh, kind of medical purposes in my other classes. So to me, I thought, you know, this is, this is the same technology, just at a bigger scale and, and preventative. It's not, kind of, it's proactive. It's thinking about things from, uh, from the beginning instead of kind of afterwards uh, that in, in the way medicine does. So I thought this is so obvious. Like this is the natural next step for humanity. We went from hunting and gathering to farming. Farming became more and more controlled systems. This is almost like the most controlled system you can create. And so I saw this enormous disruptive potential. I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to happen. At the same time, I'm taking a little bit longer with this question. I hope it's, it helps. At the same time, the movie The Corporation had just come out. And I watched it. And if you haven't seen that movie, The Corporation, it talks about uh, Monsanto and the Terminator seeds and all this kind of stuff that was happening in the food system back then, um, and well, and still happens today. And I thought, oh my gosh, this will happen to cell ag too. And so I decided to take this chance to uh, investigate cell ag more deeply because on one hand, I thought it had this enormous power to change the world. But on the other hand, I thought how it changes the world is kind of up to us. And we have to steer the way that it goes. And so I got involved. Uh, I wrote a, a term paper just as a student in this class. And I sent it to the person who was actually running the organization I run today back then. And he emailed me back and CC'd like 15 of the researchers I had cited. And we were suddenly doing a peer review. And I had to email him saying, like, you know, I'm just an undergrad student. And he said, you know what, you should publish this because there's so little on this topic. And I thought, how could something so big have so little people dedicated to it? So that's, you know, there's a the longer story than that. But that's how I got into it, by feeling like this is such a big issue. Someone needs to get involved because the, the ramifications are so gigantic. So when I, start, when I was in that class, cellular agriculture globally was maybe one or two people around the world who was working on growing food in the lab. And the reason for that is CELAG is kind of at this intersection between medical sciences, so tissue engineering, that kind of work, and then, of course, food sciences. And those two disciplines have not talked to one another before. Um, so the number of people who were working on these kind of less than five people were usually in the medical field and kind of doing like a secret experiment in the corner of their lab, kind of to themselves, where they're like, oh, this is cool, but they didn't receive grant money for it. They maybe did, probably didn't have food scientists working on it. It was kind of just a, a theoretical thing. Today, um, there are over 150 companies around the world, probably over $5 billion of investment in those companies, all working on things from growing meat, salmon, uh, chicken, pork, um, foie gras, honey, chocolate. Oh my gosh, so many different products. Um, and it, it seems to be a pretty vibrant uh, scene on the startup side. In the public academic space, it's a lot smaller right now. I would say maybe 1% of all funding in the world is in the public space right now. So it's kind of like an upside down uh, tech sector because we have so much uh, support in the private sector, but there's no like place for a high school student to study cellular agriculture today. There are no dedicated degree programs. So there is lacking a lot of kind of public infrastructure to support what's happening. So the conversations in cell ag have changed a lot. I would say the past 10 years were a zero to one conversation. And from here forward is a one to WTF conversation. So the zero to one, so uh, I run a nonprofit called New Harvest, and we describe ourselves as a field building organization. And so our idea was 
cell lag is not going to happen unless a lot of people want it to happen. It can't be just me. And I was very inspired by this quote from Carl Sagan where he says, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first create the universe. And I thought to myself, if I want to make you know, a burger from cells, it's not going to come about from me multiplying cells in the lab. It's going to come about from creating an entire universe that wants this to happen. So in my organization, I thought, OK, how do we build this field? How do we build this universe? In the beginning, we helped co-found companies. And we helped put founders to, together and kind of create an environment that was um, kind of encourage them to do this crazy thing. So I helped co-found two companies, one making milk proteins, one making egg proteins. And from there, we saw so much excitement in the investment space. They were like, great, people want to do that. That has a life of its own. That universe is running over there. Let's work on the next gap. At that time, the gap was, who are the scientists? You know, these, these were you know, MBA students coming to me saying, I need to meet a technical co-founder. But where were the technical co-founders? <laughs> So that's when we decided to start a fellowship program where we were going to fund kind of entrepreneurially minded uh, scientists in the field who are willing to dedicate their whole lives to this completely new field that didn't have funding, didn't really have an ecosystem, often didn't have supervisors, and get, give them everything they need to kind of run in SALAG. So we've given, I think, 57 grants to uh, 36 universities or something like that. Don't quote me on those numbers. Um, but we tried to kind of create that academic field. Then we moved into the next space because a lot of those academic researchers were starting to receive government grants. And so said, great, now that's going to live on its own. So now we're working on interesting gaps in the field where we think that the public and private sectors need to really come together and center the mission. Because these ideas that we're going to make food that better for the planet, there's no incentives for that. There's no, um, there's no one saying, like, you have to make something that's going to have uh, fewer greenhouse gas emissions, or you're actually going to make a product that's going to be better for animals. No one's measuring that. So in my organization, we try to work on things like standards and norms in the field. We try to figure out ways we can all rally together around safety and how do we fill in gaps in safety. We try to figure out ways we can keep that kind of mission-centric and keep the kind of market stuff still there, but... Um, not the middle of it. Um, so I think the takeaway for today is that cellular agriculture is not going to change the world. Um, climate change is going to change the world. Climate change is going to change agriculture, and it is do it's not even it's going to. It is right now. The rules of farming have changed. So it is up to us, the world, to change agriculture. And to me, cellular agriculture is the biggest idea for changing the world. I don't think it's about picking one idea. I think it's about cellular agriculture has so much momentum behind it. How do we use that disruption to make cell ag the best version of itself and really reimagine that whole world? How are we going to use cell ag to bring in more regenerative practices? How are we going to use cell ag to give indigenous people their land back? How are we going to completely change the way we use that one third of our planet? And so change, I, I just want people to remember we, we are in a changing world. This is not the thing that's changed. Change is all around us all the time. You know, I'm from Edmonton, where Wayne Gretzky is from. And he has a quote, which is, skate to where the puck is going to be. This is what we have to be thinking about. We need to be skating to where the puck is going to be, not thinking about um, the world as a stable place right now. <laughs>